willkommen zurück zu einer Bonusfolge von Dark House of Ashes. Letzte Folge haben wir in einer extra langen finalen Folge House of Ashes beendet. Haben alle durchgebracht, was ich immer noch sehr froh darüber bin und äh, schön, dass ihr eingestellt habt bei dieser kleinen Bonusfolge, wo ich euch einfach nur die Bonusinhalte mal präsentiere. Habe ich auch bei den anderen zwei Teilen gemacht. Äh, und mache ich immer, wenn es bei so Spielen gibt. Deshalb äh, klicken wir mal auf Bonusinhalte und störe auch gar nicht mehr groß. Ich sage auch mal gar nichts mehr groß dazu. Ich werde nicht groß was sagen. Was werde ich am Ende? Ähm, es gibt, glaube ich, wieder einen Comic. Ne, ein Video. Achso, ich glaube tatsächlich, es wird eine sehr kurze Folge, weil die Aussage von der Hübschen kennen wir schon. Ich glaube aber nur die Zusammenfassung. Äh, aber immerhin, die zwei Interviews kann ich euch zeigen. Da wird die Folge vielleicht sehr kurz, aber ich wollte es nicht noch in der Folge nachher oder vielleicht interessiert es euch nicht. Und ich will die Folge auch nicht unnötig in die Länge strecken, oh, die letzte. Deswegen würde ich sagen, hören wir uns einfach mal das Interview mit Ashley Tischler an. Der Cover-Artist und auch der von Rachel, die ihr bestimmt alle von zum Beispiel High School Musical kennt. Schauen wir doch mal. Queen bitch finds out about this, she's gonna flip her shit. Rachel and I, we know each other. Sir? The queen bitch you're referring to is his wife. Nice work, hotshot. Ashley Tisdale, welcome. Now, Ashley plays Rachel in Supermassive Games' Dark Pictures Anthology's House of Ashes. All right, Ashley, what can you tell me about your character? My character, Rachel, is a CIA operative, mm -hmm. and it is taking place in 2003 in the Gulf War, and she is on a mission to find chemical weapons, so she's pretty badass. Wow. This is your first time doing a video game. This is my first time, yeah. Wow. So how does that process compare to maybe the stuff that you've done you know, on, on camera before? I think that it's just very obviously a different approach to it. I do a lot of voiceover for animation series, so I would say it's more in line awesome. with that because you're in a studio all day and it's like you and the script and then also like some of the other characters, but it's just like kind of going through it really fast versus, you know, one scene on a TV show or a movie could take like an hour to two hours. So you're constantly going through it. It's a really long process. But it's cool, it's different. You're wearing like heavy machinery on your head. <laughs> And it's like getting all of your facial expressions. So it's pretty crazy. You can just be like completely like so muscular by the time you're done. Your neck will be. I know. <laughs> My neck this. is super strong. Yeah, the strongest neck ever now. <laughs> yeah. And, and how do you prepare for something like that? Then I feel like is the, the script, it's not maybe necessarily you're preparing for particular scenes, everything is so varied. Like how, do, how do you really kind of get ready for it? I pretty much, you know, obviously read the script beforehand, but I don't spend a lot of time on it like I would another script, like either with a movie or a TV, because it's the same thing of how I approach animations, is that I know when I'm here, I'm going to be with the director, and they're going to have me do it like multiple different ways, because there is multiple different directions the character can go. So if I were to fully prepare, I would m maybe like, put myself in this like, well, it's got to be this way. And I want to feel free to like be able to have them say, do it more sympathetic and do it more angry. And so I kind of don't fully prepare. I just know who the character is. And as long as I know the intention of what I'm saying, then I'm good. What is it? The guy who served me, I don't know. He was looking at me pretty strange. Uh, probably doesn't get to see a woman like you around these parts very often. Especially one that showered. But with any series or, or film, there's just that one linear path for your character. Yeah. And with this, you have the option of there's living out many the different multiple. Arcs. <laughs> yeah, how do you kind of keep it all straight or keep a, you know, a continuity be, with your character through all that? Honestly, I don't even remember half of it. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's just obviously relying on the director. And the guys at Super Massive, they're just really great at knowing where we are in the storyline. And so it's just heavily trusting them. <laughs> and, yeah. and then, you know, just kind of knowing, yeah, that it's just gonna go. I can't, you know, like there's just so many different areas that it can go. And I could die in one of the things and I could become a vampire. I can mm -hmm. like live. It's just like, it's so crazy how opposite. It's got to be interesting too to think that someone's going to like play you in a game and then maybe you'll die or you'll live or you'll Yeah. like the people will be in control of your of your future. I know, I think it's going to be really crazy just seeing my face on like the character, you know? Like mm -hmm. that's going to be so wild. It's 
so crazy how far video games have come. It's so much more cinematic and like the movies that it's pretty wild. It's like beautiful to watch, but um, it's going to be crazy. <laughs> Now, I guess we have a couple rapid fire questions that I'd like to, to hit you with as well. Okay, ready for this? I'm okay, ready. so bitten by a vampire or buried alive? Oof. Yeah, bitten by a vampire. Oh, really? Well, then you get to live forever, so, you know. That is, that is <laughs> true. Okay, I never thought of that, that element of it. Things that you've shot so far, do you have a, a favorite scene? I think my favorite scene would have to be um, probably early on, between Rachel and her husband. It's a flashback and it's them in the car. And um, it's a moment in time that kind of changes everything. And what I love about it is that it really shows who Rachel was and how it changed her to become who she is today. There's just so much happening in the game that it's just like a moment where it's just like really kind of stripped down and one-on-one. -on -one, and I think it's a really beautiful scene. What is it? The guy who served me, I, I don't know, he was, he was looking at me pretty strange. You know, my sole objective, Rach, is to make you happy. Doesn't matter where we are or what we're going through, I'll always put a smile on your face. <laughs> See, I told you. So how do you get into that? Because I feel like, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's such a sudden change from one scene to the next. So how do you kind of really get into that? moment so quickly. I think how we've done it is that we would start off with the earlier stuff okay. so it's kind of like you're building to the bigger pieces and um, yeah usually the end of the day we'll have like the biggest stuff whether that's us like screaming and fighting because it obviously drains yeah. us and our vocals so you know they know to kind of like have us do the whole like action stuff at the very end of the day. They're breaking through the perimeter. You got any bright ideas? Now's the time. <laughs> You're the odd of being like, okay, now we're gonna be sweet, and now we're gonna be screaming. It's and hard you're to gonna go dying, backwards. And you're <laughs> gonna be back alive again, and this is a touching moment, and you're gonna die. <laughs> yeah, the first time it's gonna be like a strange experience, kind of going off on your own and, and, and acting out that kind of yeah. separate. Yeah, it's definitely a very interesting process to watch, and it's different from anything I've ever done. Has it been hard to navigate doorways with the camera on? Like, do you find your... Oh, no, I take them off right away. Okay. Anytime I can get a break, because it is a heavy thing, and so it's just like most of the time I'm sitting on the couch with it, like, holding the helmet up, because it's like, you know, it's it's like a weight on your head. Oh, so yeah. it's pretty crazy. It's expensive equipment. You don't want to, like, bang it no. on a door frame. No, no. Well, now that they've got you in the game, they can put you in anything. I know. I'm so excited because I've never been able to play something like this. Yeah, okay. Well, that's good. Cool. Thank you. Ja, ziemlich cool, das mal so mal zu so sehen. Wir hatten auch schon die Tüsen Essen an den beiden. Glück, Jess. War jetzt die Ashley, ja. Mal was ganz anderes. So, weiter geht mit den Typen am Monstermacher. Sie hat eine kurze Kommentar über das Design der Kreaturen. Haus auf Ashes an. Ziemlich cooles Design, meiner Meinung nach. The creature has powerful claws and fangs formed from hardened an identifiable tissue. Two of the incisors appear grossly malformed and discolored. Blood is like nothing I've seen. We always like to base our stories in some sort of real world truth, a piece of folklore or a piece of mythology. With vampires, obviously, there's so much to choose from, from cultures all the way around the world. So rather than pick one particular legend, we thought it would be fun to create a monster that ties all of those legends together in some way. So we had an idea for a creature that lives underneath the ground and emerges every few years. Our vampire is actually an alien parasite. It invades a host body. The creatures that you see in House of Ashes, the winged demonic creatures, were actually once a intelligent race of cosmic nomads traveling through the stars on this big generation ship. They somehow picked up 
this alien parasite and it ravaged through their crew and their ship went out of control and crash landed into prehistoric earth where it was buried under the ground in what is now the Zagros Mountains. Being a parasite, this alien slug needs to find a host body, a, a living body or a recently dead one. Once it invades that body, it grows inside it, killing the host if the host is still alive. And its tendrils reach out into the host's brain and hijack its central nervous system, sort of reanimating it. It then goes on the hunt for blood. It feeds on the adrenaline in blood. So in order to get the adrenaline pumping, it needs to terrify its prey. So it shrieks at them and drags the kill out until the blood is really, really pumping, and then it strikes. You keep lookout. Fuck! <laughs> Look out for what? We wanted to show the viewer different forms of the creature and make them think that initially it's a demon, then they think that it's a vampire, and then finally the revelation that it's an alien. So just to explain where the parasites have come to infect some of our game characters, this shows a game character who's going through different stages, is infected, starts to affect the character, and there's a final look from that where the fangs are coming through the skull. So that's one of the developments of how our classic vampire is actually a host. Another example of that is an Akkadian warrior who's been taken over by the parasite. And again, the fangs have come through, the vines are poking through the head. This human is now being taken over, his skin is dying, the parasite is trying to grow within. But we progress that into looking at the design on the alien demon, I call it. This had to have very unique elements that came through from the head design. So we've got a very animalistic head here, but also we've got the fangs. These fangs are coming from the parasite that's within, so the fangs are coming through. It's almost deforming the shape of the host. Oh, shit. What the fuck happened to your teeth, buddy? We refined that further to what is our final head, where the ear is part of the skull and it flexes open. A bit like a frill lizard where the frill of the, the canopy comes out, our head is actually moving apart. And we've got illustrations that show that where the head is dormant and is concealed, but then as it hears and wants to resonate, the skull expands open. And that then allows the creature to hear and pick up on anything within the environment. The characters, it's always good to base at least some of it on anatomy that we recognize. And that provides a foundation for the vampire. It's bipedal and human in its structure. But we've just changed things, tweaked them, made them a bit more alien. So, for example, the ribs join together at the sternum to form a rib cage. But we've expanded it out quite a lot, and some of the ribs are fused together to make bony plates. It's just to suggest that it's had a very different evolution from a human. We tried a version with human-style legs, but in the end, we went for a dog-type leg. It just made it more creature-like and more threatening. And we added bird-like talons on the toes, just to give it some natural weapons and make it into a predator. We didn't want to focus too much on bat reference, because we were trying to steer away a bit from the classic bat-like vampire. We did go for two sets of bat-like wings. One of the shots in the game is of the vampire jumping down from above, backlit with its wings out in an attack pose. And when we saw that pose, we decided to add an extra set of wings attached at the hip joint. It just really helped that silhouette. The environment is very interesting because they can use not just the floor, they can fly as well. They can walk on the walls, but they've got claws. So imagine something really interesting in a cave where you've got creatures coming towards you, you know, from every angle. I think that visually is something impactful and very interesting to look at, and it's scary. One of the interesting parts is the finding of those nuances and details that really bring the character to life. How does it move? How does it behave and act? We had motion capture, and then we had the more traditional computer animation keyframing. On the motion capture side, there were a variety of different setups that we tested. We had arm extensions, and then we had various different leg stilts that our creature actor used. But what was apparent when filming this was that it really limited his movement. 
So in the end, we decided not to use any of that, and he just performed himself. Basically, this gave him the freedom to really express that physicality in acting and gesture. They react sound like bats. We hear you. They hunt you. The vampires have these head plates, these bony kind of gristly structures on their heads that click and vibrate, kind of like a bat's echolocation. They're used to survey environments and to locate prey. We went through a lot of different iterations and we tried a lot of different things. Like I think I sampled keyboards and mouse clicks and then used a scooter fender and a wet trainer. And it made this organic clicky, squeaky sound. And then I had a friend of mine like in the States take a taser to a bunch of meat and a bunch of like organic material. And it came out a lot more aggressive. It just sounded meaner. I got something for you. And then the biggest thing that we had was this little tiny drum and a rod with fishing line in between it. So when you twisted a rod, it made this clicking and popping sound. So that ended up being one of the main tonal layers for it. But none of them quite fit right. But once we put them all together and like layered them all together on top of each other, then it started to actually work as a holistic organic thing. Something entirely new to House of Ashes, which is a classic horror movie trope, is the vampire point of view shots, which we use a very wide lens and we use some perspective distortion on those shots, which helps sell the power and hunger of the vampires as they're chasing the soldiers, and it helps make the soldiers feel very small and very weak. And doing so, it also helps us as the player realise that these vampires are inhuman and that when we're watching what they're doing, they're bouncing off the walls and they're climbing on the ceilings and flying. At any time in the game, the players could be running through an endless maze of tunnels and we use very tight shots on these with a lot of handheld, a lot of tilt again to emphasise this claustrophobicness and this tension and not being able to see what's chasing them. And it's in complete contrast then to later on in the game where we see these grand environments that they uncover, which should be a temple, a city or things like that, that we have these wide shots that really sit still and just let the player soak in that environment. This is the most complex creature that we have ever animated in this studio. But um, the challenge, is more than a challenge, is, a, is the, the fun to do it. Because it's not like a real creature. You can push it in a way that you can use your imagination to make it more interesting. We're facing an enemy we know zero about. An enemy of unknown size and their home turf sucks to be us. <laughs> Sehr cool, muss ich sagen. Das kann man so sehen, wie das, sich die Kette ausgedacht haben. Schon cool. So, und ich glaube, die war, das war es auch großteils schon, denn die anderen beiden kennen wir schon. Wir gucken es trotzdem mal kurz rein. Ich glaube, das sind noch einfach nur auf die Tagebücher nochmal. 24. September 1945. Wenn man eine Einladung von Lady Bradshaw erhält, nimmt man an. Mary und ich wollten eigentlich in die Flitterwochen, aber die Chance, mit einer der besten Altertumsforscherinnen Großbritanniens zu dinieren, mussten wir nutzen. Bradshaw trug eine Brosche, die Mary sofort ins Auge fiel. Ein sumerisches Relikt aus einer Ausgrabungsstätte im haschemitischen Königreich im Irak. Nach dem Essen zeigte sie uns einen anderen Fund aus derselben Grabung, eine goldene Keilschrifttafel. Sie meinte, die Tafel sei das letzte Puzzleteil ihres Lebenswerks. Eine Karte, die zum Grab von Alexander dem Großen führen soll. Wenn sie recht hat, befindet sich das Grab irgendwo an der Grenze zwischen Syrien und dem Irak. Lady Bradshaw will, dass wir die Expedition für sie leiten. Es scheint, dass wir unsere Flitterwochen in einer staubigen Ausgrabungsstätte im Sargosgebirge verbringen werden. Ja, doch, also es ist genau dasselbe. So, Leute, das haben wir uns jetzt bei Abercobit angeguckt. Deshalb, glaube ich, war es das hier schon. Und jetzt hat Minuten die Folge, aber dafür haben wir ja nochmal als Bonus. Der extra kürzer. Wie gesagt, nach dieser Folge wird jetzt, ähm, das erste nicht zu Projekt starten. Ich würde sagen, danke fürs Zuschauen, auch bei dem Bonuspart. Danke fürs dabei sein, beim ganzen Projekt vielleicht sogar. Wenn ihr Plays zum Beispiel geschaut habt und, und, und. Schaut gerne weiter auf den Kanal, ihr findet bestimmt irgendwas anderes. Und äh, bis zum nächsten Mal, bei was auch immer ihr schaut. Bis dahin, macht's gut. Ciao, ciao. Absolutely not. We'll start believing. We are under.
attacked by. I don't know what. And you wouldn't believe me even if I tried. Hell, I don't believe it and I was there. In Sumerian myth, they say the souls of the dead went deep underground to the house of ashes. Where they lived on dust, plagued by the demons of the underworld.